Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today we are once again looking at the stuff which is past the developers, and this time we're having a look at the aviation stuff from October 2020. I just want to let you know that I do seem to have a jaw problem right now, so if I sound a little bit off or I sound a little bit more lispy than usual, that's basically why. So let's get into it straight away. We have a post from Binzy Boy, and Binzy Boy is talking about the F-111, the aardvark, the big old American machine that you can see right here. Now, when it comes to the F-111 aardvark, it is definitely an interesting machine. It is, of course, a supersonic jet, and it was designed as a night and day fighter bomber to be able to be used in pretty much every weather possible. It was able to carry ridiculous payloads loads and it was one of the best fighter bombers in the 1960s and it was in service uh, with the Royal Australian Air Force until 2010. It started its service with the United States Air Force in 1967 uh, after being first flown in 1964. Production of the aircraft was halted in 1976 where 566 aircraft were made. The USAF uh, removed the F-111 from service in 1998 and then 24 were ordered by the RAAF in 1963 and arrived in 1968. The vehicle itself uses two Pratt and, uh, Pratt and Whitney TF-30 after burning turbofan engines. Uh, the focus of the aircraft was to be able to hit targets from range and at high speeds whilst also keeping a low profile. Uh, this was done because of its swept wing design, uh, which most aircraft at the time were unable to do. The aircraft itself uh, was unable to fly, and uh, when the aircraft uh, is unable to fly and pilots need to bail, the canopy could actually detach from the airframe, uh, from the airframe, and fall to the ground. With a parachute deployed shortly after its detachment, the jets uh, could also perform at eighteen thousand three hundred meters, and the swept wings on the aircraft allowed it to reach uh, slow velocities to supersonic speeds at sea level. Uh, so this is an incredibly fast machine. You can see the swept wings in both areas right there. The wings could rotate from 16 degrees to 72 degrees and the F-111 didn't need drag chutes as it was in an incredibly heavy aircraft with the wings full forward. So it was able to perform maneuvers at very slow speeds as the wings created obviously a lot more lift. So what was the max speed of this aircraft you may ask? Mac 2.5. Um, and this was at an at altitude and then at sea level Mach 1.2 so this is an incredibly fast machine with a lot of power behind it the thrust with the afterburner was 25,100 pounds uh, and then the you have which is basically the equivalent to 112 kilonewtons uh, which is just insane uh, just a ridiculously powerful vehicle and then you talk about its actual weaponry uh, now this is where it gets even crazier so this thing had a total of nine hard points, eight under wing, and then one under the fuselage between the engine, and then plus two attached points in weapons in, in the weapons bay, and it had a capacity of 31,500 pounds. This was a true chonker. It also could access an M61 20mm Vulcan cannon with 2,084 rounds, but this was later removed to allow for air-to-air -air missiles. The bombs that this thing could carry, the Mark 82 500 pounders, the 83s, which were 1,000, the 84, uh, which was a 2,000 pound bomb, the Mark 117, a 750 pound, the BLU 109, which was a 2,000 pounder, could also carry nuclear bombs, and then also, uh, a runway cratering bomb. It could also carry laser guided bombs as well, the 2000 pounder, 500 pounder, and also the GBU 12, which was a 4800 pound bomb, and the GBU 28 penetration bomb. When it comes to missiles as well, it could also carry the AGM 69 SRAM thermonuclear air to service, air to surface missile. This was only on the FBE 111A though, but still. 
How ridiculous. Then you got AGM 130s, the standoff bombs, and then the AIM 9 sidewinders as well. So, yeah. Um, the UK also ordered them, but they never actually arrived. I'm not entirely sure why that was the case. My guess is probably the contract was, um, you know, it was too high or something, or the UK realized they didn't need it. Uh, but basically, what Binzi wants is he wants two uh, vehicles put in. Now, I do want to point something out. This post was made in 20. 2018. <laughs> so this was made in the 12th of December 2018, where the only supersonic vehicles we had in the game were the F-100D and also the MiG-19. So Binzi wanted to put these in when we only had the F-100 and he wanted to put them at Tenno. So yeah, kind of a bit crazy, but nowadays it makes a little bit more sense. And he wants the FB-111A and the F-111D. Uh, so therefore, we would have a naval fighter, tactical fighter variant in the F-111D, and the FB-111 would be the strategic bomber slash jet bomber variant. So yeah, uh, that is the vehicle itself. It makes a lot more sense nowadays instead of two years ago, so hey-ho. This is the next post from Epic Blitzkrieg 87, and what he's talking about is a MiG-23 variant. Now, the MiG-23 variant that he's picked is actually a pretty cool one. Um, it's basically uh, one of the better variants, um, the MiG-23 MLA. It's seen as the second best MiG-23. It had a lockdown shootdown capability with R-24Rs, R-24Ts, R-60Ms, and also R-73 missiles. It was an improved MiG-23 ML, um, uh, which uh, was used by the Germans, uh, so therefore you would have basically the MLA for the uh, Soviets and then the ML for the Germans, uh, so that would be how that works. The MLA was the aircraft that uprated the previous MiG-23 ML. It was a second generation version of the MiG-23M, and it had many improvements over the mig 20 M, such as new missiles, better radar, new engine, and in comparison to the ML, the MLA featured an array of new improvements, uh, which would obviously be nice to see. So after the MiG-23 ML entered service in 1975, uh, let's just show you this. There we go. Um, the An improved MLA fighter was created for the Air Force, and uh, it was close in capabilities to the MiG-23P. It was equipped with a Sapphire 23 MLA lightweight radar, uh, equipped with a new element base, a TP-26 heat direction finder, and a DSP-17 automatic rifle scope. The armament included the latest R-24R missiles, which had a launch range of 40 kilometers, and the R-24Ts, which ranged at 25 to 35 kilometers, uh, which were created as a temporary replacement for the R-27s. The missiles had a combined guidance uh, system with radio correction on the marching section of the trajectory. And a little later, the uh, MiG's armament uh, was supplemented by the most advanced short-range missile, which was the all-aspect IRR-73 at the time, and it had a larger range of launch ranges and target acquisition angles with a homing head than the American counterpart, which was the AIM-9L at the time, and due to some simplification of the design and improvement of aerodynamics, it was possible to bring the practical ceiling of the aircraft to 19,000 meters. The weapon system itself ensured the fight against air targets in an altitude range of 40 to 24,000 meters, uh, which gave the fighter the opportunity uh, to fight with the later weapons of that time. The small sized strategic cruise missile of the type, which was the Tomahawk and the ALCM. And in 1978, 1983, 1100 aircraft units of the type were built at the Banner of Labor plant. So yeah, it's kind of an insane machine, um, definitely one which we could uh, see when it comes to uh, War Thunder, and who knows when it comes to 
this uh, ridiculous, uh, <laughs> ridiculous one. A lot of people have been asking for it, you know, going forward. If you want some general stats on the uh, aircraft, um, there was around about 1100 built, as we talked about before. And then if you, you know, have a look at some of the other ones, you know, the armaments were just insane on it as well. It also had optional uh, 223 millimeter guns as well. So you could add that uh, to the machine as well. The service ceiling being 18 1500 on the machine meant that it was able to go pretty high and uh the maximum speed at uh, sea level was 1100 kilometers an hour with 45 degrees sweep and then at 72 degrees sweep 1350 kilometers an hour as well uh, obviously the uh, machine had uh, adjustable wings uh, as we looked on the aardvark as well that seems to be a mechanic which is showing when it comes to this aviation past the developers and another mechanic as well which you may have seen from the f-111 is big old bombers and here is another one this is from Terek G2014 and this is a British boy and I tell you what it is kind of a ridiculous machine this is the Handley Page Victor B2RS the victorious Vic as it's known and the Victor was a product of the V force requirements you may have seen some of the other machines uh, of that even in War Thunder is a few user missions such as the Vulcan uh, it was the last of the three to be finished with the first flights uh, taking place on the 24th of December 1952 and the Victor, like the Valiant and the Vulcan, was designed with high-level bombing in mind. But unfortunately at the time, the improvement of SAM missiles meant uh, it had to switch to low-level bombing instead. But unfortunately, this kind of killed its role as a bomber when it was found that repeated low-level flights resulted in excess uh, fat, uh, I think it's uh, fatuige, uh, on the wing spars. I'm guessing it's supposed to be fatigue on the wing spars. It's just uh, spelled a bit weirdly. And this was uh, not the end of the Victor, though. Uh, unlike the Valiant, it was saved by the versatility. Many of the Victors uh, were converted to tanker roles. The Vixor service up until 1965, only 10 years after her full introduction into the RAF in 55, and the Vix service history is a distinguished one, nevertheless, serving as a primary tanker aircraft for the Vulcan bomber during the famous Operation Black uh, Book. So this is another one of those high altitude crazy bombers uh, that the uh, British used and uh, even though it wasn't really one which uh, was you know used that much in that role it doesn't mean that it couldn't carry the stuff. So this thing could carry 48,000 pound iron bombs, 39 2,000 pound iron bombs, or one 22,000 Grand Slam bomb, or two 12,000 Tor Boys. And uh, also, uh, you had ARMs, uh, which could be mounted on the underwing pylon, which is uh, the thing that I showed before. Uh, so let's just see. Whoop. Well, never mind. Guessing the picture doesn't want to work. So, yeah, it's it's an insane aircraft. A lot of stuff that it could carry. Very big engines on it and all of that. It used RR Conway 201s, uh, which, you know, give a hell of a lot of power to it. And this could easily be another one of those big old bombers that the British get in the near future. The next one is from Linens, and this is talking about a pretty cool aircraft as well, in a slightly different role. So we've had the bombers, now we have the bomber hunters. This is a modified D4. It's the D4Y2S, and also the D4Y3S. These were night fighter variants of the D4Y aircraft, and they came about because in 1943, the Imperial Japanese Navy operated the J1N1S night fighter with the Shrug Music, the 20mm, to try and intercept B-17s and B-24s. But the J1N1S became obsolete because of the fact that the US Army started fielding B-29s, and the G1N1 could
could not deal with these machines, even with the Shrag music on top of it. So as a result of this, the IGN concluded that the Shrag music was effective for intercepting bombers, but the J1N1 platform was not, you know, the best at doing it. So they started developing a bunch of night fighters equipped with Shrag music as a successor to the machine, and they decided to use the D4Y as a base platform in order to do it because of its high speed and also high aircraft strength. And uh, the D4Y2S was one of the aircraft generated by the plan. So what they did with the D4Y2 uh, is they removed its tail gunner, and as you can see, they put in a 20mm Type 99 Mark II Model 4 machine gun, or a cannon, uh, in that it had 250 uh, bullets loaded in it. They also uh, set it at 30 degrees and uh, put it like there. The canopy rear part was also changed from the conventional glass to metal as well to keep it protected. And then the sighting device for the 7.7mm machine gun was changed from the conventional scope sight to the optical sighting sight as well. And the height of the tail wing was extended from the D4Y2 and it became the same height as the D4Y3 and it was remodeled uh, to be able to also load four Type 3 number 1 Mark 28 rockets which we already see in the game. So it would have basically the same performance as the D4Y2 that we have in game apart from it would have access to the Shrug music. It could also be able to still carry the 500 kilo bomb and also the rockets which it can mount in game so there's no reason why this uh, couldn't pass, uh, couldn't happen. They did the same thing with the D4Y3 uh, as well, um, added the Shrug music to it, so there you have an interesting Bomber Hunter. The next one is from MC205V, and this is an Italian jet, a kind of interesting one as well. This is the Armaci uh, MB339K, the Veltro 2. And its story starts after the success which was obtained with a two-seater version of advanced training and light tactical support, which was the MB-339 in 1980. Aramachi decided to build a single-seater version and call it the MB-339K. And uh, the K version was for ground attack and close air support, and it was to provide a simple, economic, and robust modern aircraft, and the large fixed geometry vanes of the comp compressor provided a great tolerance to damage from ingestion from external objects, obviously FOD, you know, foreign object, uh, debris, or damage. Uh, uh, when I did like a... Uh, internship, I suppose you call it BAE Systems. Uh, it was kind of interesting learning about all of that stuff. The engine itself generally required reduced maintenance. The structure was designed to withstand uh, high fatigue resulting from low altitude attacks with an expected operating life of over 5,000 flight hours and the additional space that was freed with the redesign of the cabin is uh, allowed the designers to transfer the onboard equipment from the nose of the aircraft to the center of the the fuselage, thus increasing the maximum fuel supply by installing another tank with the addition of a wide range of armaments and equipment. This included electronic suppression systems, a more powerful engine, which uh, was the Rolls-Royce Viper 680-43, and even though this uh, vehicle was not built in series, uh, so it wasn't ever went to production, there was only one of them, or one prototype which remains at the Aramachi headquarters, uh, it's definitely something that should be considered when it comes to the Italian tech tree. Its main armament was two 30mm DEFA 553 cannons, and its maximum speed at sea level was 904km an hour, and the maximum speed at 9000 was 931. It had six hard points, or six maximum load weights of 1815 kilos. It could have two 30mm gun pods, two 12.7 gun pods, six mini gun pods, if it wanted, my god, can you imagine? Uh, six bombs and fire bombs uh, with 750 pounds each, or 4,000 pound bombs. It could carry cluster bombs, flare bombs, uh, it could carry rocket launchers, LAUs, it could carry Mavericks if it wanted to, it could also carry anti ship missiles, and also the Matra Magics or the Sidewinders. This thing would be able to pretty much use anything that it wanted.
mounted and a pretty cool little cast option for the Italians. And the last one is from Typhoon Crow and it's time to talk about something that looks oddly like a vampire. And you wouldn't be uh, wrong by thinking that. This is not a vampire, but it is a vampire. Uh, it's the French, technically, vampire, uh, so very much an interesting plane. This was a, uh, this was a French, uh, designed, uh, a French designed vampire, the SE535 Mistral. So the plane also used the Rolls-Royce Nen, um, even though it was built by Hispano Souza. And the key difference between the FB31, uh, vampire, and the SE535 are the intakes. The FB31 has belly intakes and original sized wing root intakes where you can see the SE535, which is this aircraft, has no belly intakes but larger wing root intakes instead. So a major use of the Vampire was for the French government and it was in urgent need of suitable combat aircraft to build up its depleted post-war air force. The Vampire itself proved ideal for the task and the agreement including licensed production and development of the SNCA Sud-Est uh, was reached in, in the spring of 1949. The production plans were being made, uh, some 76 Mark V's were supplied from the RAF stocks, and the initial license-built version was known as the FB Mark 51. It made its maiden flight uh, on the 27th of January 1950, and the production lines maintained a high rate from the start, because de Havilland supplied major assemblies initially, followed by unequipped components and finally detailed parts, until full license production was was established on the aircraft. Uh, the result in a production rate of 10 aircraft per month only seven months after the first delivery. And the Rolls-Royce uh, Nen engine was already in production in France and it was decided to adapt the Vampire to this power plant. And the improvements were made uh, to the original de Havilland design Mark II by deleting the extra air intakes on top of the fuselage and refining the wing root intakes. The further development by the SNCA SE uh, left only the forward fuselage, the tail booms, and the tail plane common to the British version. The new Mistral also had an ejector seat, which is kind of interesting. And the first production Mistral made its maiden flight at the end of 1950. 51, where it achieved a maximum speed of 580, sorry, 578 miles per hour at sea level, which was 50 miles per hour faster than the standard Mark V. There was 183 vampires and 250 Mistrals produced under license in France, replacing the F-47Ds with the fourth Escad in 1951, followed by the third, fifth, and seventh Escad until uh, the Orugans began the service in 1954. So this thing uh, is slightly different uh, to the standard vampire that you see from the uh, from the British. The armament was similar to the FB5. The cannons were built by Hispano Sousa, but incredibly similar to the Hispano Mark Vs. And it also carried either four HVARs or four T-10 rockets or two 450 kilo bombs, which of course are the thousand pounders. So yeah, it had a slightly better performance than the Vampire FB5 because of increased better statistics, but overall it is basically a French vampire. And that brings us to the end of today's video. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time. I'd just like to thank Trigger Hippie, Universe, Conte Baraka, Elove Goat, Eugene's Terry, Ambrosius McClellan, Daniel Stanton, Martinez, B. Young, Hans, and Samuel Slick for supporting the channel.